Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the, I think this is the ninth webinar in Khan Masiel Carey's 2016 OSHA webinar series. Today, we're going to be presenting on the subject of the post-OSHA citation world. You've just received a citation from OSHA. What do you do? What are your options? What does the process look like? What are some uh, strategies you ought to be thinking about uh, and some tips for how to accomplish uh, your goals in the post-citation world. Uh, there are two faceless voices you'll hear from today. The first talking right now is Eric Kahn. Uh, I'm the chair of the OSHA Workplace Safety Practice Group at Kahn Masiel Carey. Uh, I recognize a lot of the names uh, on the list of folks who've dialed in today, so you've heard the spiel before. Uh, but my practice focuses on workplace safety and health law, uh, all aspects of that. I represent employers during inspections, investigations, enforcement actions involving primarily OSHA, but also the state plan, uh, occupational safety and health programs, uh, the United States Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, the CSB, uh, MSHA, and EPA, uh, most often where those agencies have overlapping um, uh, investigative authority or enforcement authority with OSHA. <laughs> I work with employers, their outside experts, and their uh, civil defense counsel in managing investigations of catastrophic industrial construction and manufacturing workplace accidents, uh, from explosions at refineries and, and chemical plants to collapses at construction sites to uh, mechanical uh, and machine-related incidents in the manufacturing uh, context. Uh, I handle all aspects of OSHA litigation, from criminal investigations and prosecutions to appeals and litigation of OSHA citations. Uh, I also work with employers to develop and conduct safety and health training, compliance counseling, and audits of employers' workplaces and safety and health programs, either directly or uh, by directing the work of a consultant so that that work can be done under attorney-client privilege. I'm very pleased to be joined today for the first time uh, by the newest member of our uh, workplace safety and health team at Con Masiel Carey, Micah Smith, who just joined us this month and is joining us for our first webinar in the series. Micah? Thanks, Eric. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be uh, joining you guys at Con Masiel Carey. I have been doing OSHA work for a few years now um, with a brief break for a stint in, in China. Um, but I'm happy to be back. Um, I do a lot of the same things as, uh, as Eric does, uh, representing clients um, for all aspects of OSHA litigation from inspections um, uh, up through a discovery and trial. Um, uh, happy to help clients with uh, the problems that arise, whether it's questions about their record keeping or their serious workplace accidents. So um, happy to be back, back at, the, uh, at the wheel. Um, and joining you all. So, All right, so what are we going to be talking about today? I've given you a little bit of a preview, but our agenda uh, for the webinar today is uh, to talk about the post-OSHA citation process. We'll talk a little bit about your options and the considerations. What happens right after you receive the citation? What are the different routes you can take to resolving the citations? And what what things should you be thinking about uh, as a business for how these citations may affect your business either, present, either presently or in the future uh, to help steer uh, which path you ought to take to resolve the citations as well as developing a strategy uh, for, for what would be an acceptable uh, and successful resolution to the citation. The presentation will also cover the sort of step-by-step -step process, the different phases that a litigation or, or a contest of a set of OSHA citations would follow. And then finally, we'll review some settlement goals. What are some things that you should be hoping to accomplish to minimize, mitigate, or eliminate the negative effects that a citation uh, may cause to your business? And then some strategies for how to accomplish those goals. So getting started um, right out of the gate, let's move to the, uh, to this, the process itself. And uh, Michael, you got you got control of the slides. Yes, let me advance that for you. All right, so we're we're here at the beginning of the process, or actually not quite the beginning. You've had OSHA on site uh, inspecting your facility. 
may have had a closing conference where they told you um, you were going to get some inspections or some citations or not. Uh, but now you have your citations in hand. What do you do, Eric? Well, you've got a handful of options. You know, you'll see this uh, written into the package that OSHA delivers to you. But you've got these options for how you can address this. And the first option is here, here's the address where you can send the check. You can just pay the fine and accept the citations as issued. And I can tell you in my 16 years of doing this, that has never been the best scenario for my client. Uh, this is almost like the SATs. If you just show up and spell your name correctly, you get a few bonus points right out of the gate. The same is true for dealing with OSHA citations. There's almost always a better outcome. I would say there is always a better outcome than just accepting the citations as issued and paying the fine. A next scenario is you're, you know, you're satisfied that the violation occurred as OSHA alleged. The penalty is of no concern to you. But the abatement is a real problem. Either it simply cannot be done, it's not feasible to do it, uh, or, or it creates some other major business problem for you. In that scenario, what you could do to resolve the citations is essentially accept the citation but uh, request a variance. And requesting a variance means, yes, we committed a technical violation of the law, but the abatement you're asking for is not feasible or appropriate for some reason or another. Uh, and, and just as I said, in the 16 years I've been doing this, paying the fine and accepting the citations is never the right outcome. I would say in that same amount of time, I've seen very, very few successful applications for a variance. In fact, I think you can count on you know, one hand, maybe two hands, the number of active variances that OSHA has in effect in the entire country right now. So let's say that that's not a great option because it's not necessarily a realistic option. A third scenario is requesting from OSHA within 15 working days of receiving the citation and participating in during that 15-day period what's called an informal settlement conference and reaching an agreeable settlement with OSHA during that informal settlement conference. That is a, a, good, a good option, a scenario where these... Um, uh, cases are often resolved. However, um, the, um, uh, it is becoming less and less realistic or less and less of a um, viable uh, settlement option as well. Uh, over the last several years, the National Office of OSHA has really tied the hands of the, um, of the different area offices around the country, put sort of maximum amounts that the area offices are allowed to reduce penalties, but very, um, uh, really scrutinize the frequency that OSHA uh, or the area offices are downgrading violations from, um, uh, from willful to serious or otherwise. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people saying that they're not getting sound. Um, hopefully everybody's uh, got the dial-in number and is dialed in now. Um, okay, so I think everybody is, gonna, is connecting that way and hearing us. Um, hopefully that has solved the problem. Um, <clears throat> so in other words, the informal settlement conference is a good option. It used to be a very good option. These days it's becoming less viable because OSHA's hands are tied uh, in that room. And one of the things to think about is when you engage in the informal settlement conference, you're sitting down across from the table who just about two weeks ago signed his or her name to the citation. They reviewed the file, they perhaps even participated in the inspection itself, and, um, and they are the ones who are, um, you know, who basically authorize the violations that are listed in the citation. So if they are, you know, basically put their name to it, invested a little bit into the, uh, into the inspection process, that's not the best audience to convince that they got it wrong and they ought to withdraw the citation. Another reason why informal settlement conferences are often, um, I don't want to say a dead end, but don't get you to the full result that you're trying to achieve. The next step is you file a notice of contest and you start, technically you initiate the litigation process, but generally speaking, most cases are resolved during this phase before any real litigation is undertaken at all. In this process, there's really two avenues you pursue. You file the notice of contest and very quickly start engaging in settlement discussions with the attorneys for OSHA in the United States Department of Labor Solicitor's Office. 
And I have found that even though you know attorneys are getting involved, you're going down the process a little bit further, uh, this does not create a more contentious environment. In fact, I found that this is often a better environment to resolve cases because the person that you're negotiating with is less personally invested in the citation. They didn't participate in the inspection most often. They didn't write the citation. They didn't sign the citation. And they are the ones that know that if this is not settled, they've got to go before a judge and prove that the violation occurred as alleged. And that person, I think, takes often a more realistic view, uh, a more pragmatic view of the citations, and therefore uh, you're often able to achieve, I found, a better settlement, uh, a settlement that accomplishes the employer's goals when dealing with the solicitor's office than when uh, dealing with the area office. So file the notice of contest, engage in settlement discussions with the solicitor is probably where most of the cases I've dealt with are being resolved at this uh, at this point. The, the, the next option beyond that, and it's really sort of a blended or hybrid option with the first, is you file that notice of contest. You do engage in settlement discussions with the solicitor sort of throughout the entire process, but really you're not achieving the goals that you're trying to accomplish even through those negotiations. So you head down the path of litigating. You engage in discovery with the, uh, with the government and, and ultimately get before uh, a judge, uh, an administrative law judge, as part of the Independent OSH Review Commission, and have the judge decide the case. If you can't convince OSHA that they've got it wrong or to make the changes that are important to you, you present your case to a judge and hopefully the judge rules in your favor and you accomplish what you need to uh, that way. So, Eric, um, we've gone through the list of things here, and um, you know you've given some of the pros and cons. But can you uh, give an outline of how you decide? Um, you know, you, not all employers are the same; not all the work sites are the same. Can you give it, give the audience a, a sense of how they choose which path is best for them? Right, right, and I and I think they you know which path is best for you is going to depend on a lot of different variables. You know, it's going to depend on what are your goals, what are the things that are important to you, and we're going to talk about in some detail uh, what are the different considerations that you will have after you receive a citation. Are you just um, uh, you know, dissatisfied with the size of the penalty? Do you have problems with the abatement? Uh, do you foresee potential uh, civil litigation uh, related to an injury uh, that is also related to these citations that you need to address through the OSHA citations or make sure that the citations don't affect so these factors are all going to be different for, for different employers, uh, and, and they're going to be different you know, based on the circumstances of the citation. So different employers, like a small business, may be more focused on addressing the penalty, addressing very costly statement. Government contractors, for example, or, or any kind of contractor, uh, is going to be um, very concerned with keeping their record clean. So it may have nothing, their concerns may have nothing to do with the penalty at all. It may just be about um, making sure that your, um, uh, your record is clean so that you're not disqualified from bidding on a big government contract or uh, something like that. So it's going to depend on you know, what your priorities are as an employer and the circumstances of the citation. So if there was, it was an incident that involved or a serious injury, and there is a risk of a civil uh, suit, you're going to be focused on what this citation, uh, how it may be used in the litigation process in that civil suit, uh, perhaps much more so than whatever penalty OSHA is asking for. Uh, and then thinking about you know, whether the citation goes to the core of your business. You know, If you operate a machine shop with 10,000 presses and, and metal bending and forming machines and all sorts of equipment that has you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of opportunities for guarding to be misplaced uh, or removed or to not be effective or lock out tag out to not be implemented and you get guarding or lotto citations, well, that's going to be something that you're going to focus on trying to keep your record clean as opposed to concern yourself too much with the, um, uh, with the penalty uh, or even characterization issues. It's all about we've got to get this item off our record because this is very much at the core of our business, something that we're going to you know, perhaps trip over again uh, and face you know, very potential significant consequences 
um, for not ha- for for having those things on our record, maintained on our record. All right, so I guess maybe one of the uh, best ways to uh, illustrate this for everyone is to set up a couple of um, hypotheticals just so we can run these through um, what it would really look like for you. Um, And I'll I'll outline the first one here. Uh, Let's just say you're an employer. um, You've got a small construction business, maybe 20 or 30 employees. Um, You're usually a subcontractor at uh, different jobs. Um, And you, of course, go from job to job, uh, lots of different work sites. OSHA comes in, uh, cites the, or inspects the work site you're at, um, gives you citations, and you end up with eight serious fall protection violations with an $80,000 penalty. Eric, what's the, what's the small construction business going to do in this scenario, or what do they need to worry about? Yeah, so what we've got here, we, we've listed the primary considerations that sort of every employer needs to think about and tackle when they're deciding how to resolve a set of citations. Uh, And what we've done here is we've sort of highlighted uh, in orange the ones that we think in this scenario are most applicable. So you've got a small employer who probably looks at an $80,000 penalty as, you know, eating up the margin for an entire project or maybe even multiple projects depending on the size of the small employer. So for a small employer, we have found, and this is, you know, over years of fielding calls from clients and potential clients about, you know, I just got these citations, what do I do? And hearing from them, what are the things that are most concerning to them? And also some where maybe they're not thinking about it and we we make sure that they do start thinking about it. But we have seen that penalty is a bigger deal, obviously, for smaller employers. So that's something you've got to think about is what is this $80,000 going to do to my business? And do we want to focus in our dealings with OSHA on trying to get that penalty down? Uh, For a small employer, that's a bigger deal. Uh, The risk of repeat violations, a very big deal in these circumstances uh, that we just described. This is a small small construction employer who received eight serious fall protection violations. So we sort of combine that, um, the idea is, is this at the core of your business with the risk of repeat violations? And what we mean by that is, you know, in the construction industry, there are tons of opportunities to be working at heights. And there are tons of opportunities, therefore, for a guardrail system uh, to either not be installed correctly when that work is being done or to have not been installed yet at all or for employees to forget or to deliberately um, uh, not follow your fall protection policy and not tie off. And in that environment when probably at least half of the work you do is done at elevated heights, there is like a continuous risk of repeat violations, especially in the construction industry where you're not protected by four walls in a lot of instances. Your work is exposed. And, you know, an OSHA compliance officer just driving down the road or some concerned citizen just driving down the road could see an employee working at heights without fall protection, phone in to OSHA, or the compliance officer just stops, maybe even stops across the street from your site watches for a while, takes pictures, and all of a sudden they've got you for now a repeat violation. So thinking about this, eight violations on your record is going to really put, you know, put a target on your back, make it very easy for OSHA to find and cite repeat violations. This is it's always a big deal. Remember that the penalty structure for OSHA citations is historically has been $7,000 for serious and other than serious violations and $70,000 for repeat and willful violations. Well, that changed uh, about a month ago. On August 1st, uh, the penalties shot up by 80%. So those repeat violations, they're still 10 times higher than serious violations, but now they run the risk of about $124,000 maximum per violation. So as a small employer in the construction if you're staring down the barrel of eight uh, fall protection violations, even if OSHA was willing to reduce the penalty in that initial enforcement action from 80000 to, let's say, $500, hey, you think you've got a big win, but I'm not sure that's right. If you're sitting there accepting eight fall protection violations, they stay on your record, you're set up for a lot of repeat violations, and those will blow that $80,000 right out of the water. So you've got to think carefully about that before you accept violations uh, in that context. 
um, set up for future SVEP qualification. SVEP is the Severe Violator Enforcement Program. Uh, and if you don't know much about this program, I'm not going to talk a ton about it today, but I think this is one of the worst things that OSHA has done during this administration. It is a program that, uh, that OSHA has implemented to target enforcement resources against essentially those that they consider to be bad actors. And one of the ways that they decide that you are a bad actor is by committing violations that meet certain criteria. And one of those criteria is committing two or more willful or repeat violations. I keep saying committing, but it's really OSHA alleging that you have committed two or more willful or repeat violations of high emphasis hazard. And in the scenario we're talking about here, these are fall protection violations. Two or more uh, and falls uh, in general industry and construction are considered high emphasis hazards. So if you commit two or more willful or repeat violations, then you will qualify, or fall protection violations, you will qualify into this SVEP, and it has all sorts of very dangerous consequences. So that, that's another reason here when you're looking at eight fall protection violations, and that goes to the core of your business, that one of your major considerations will be, got to clear up my, my record here. Not as concerned about the penalty, although for a small business, that $80,000 price tag is a big deal. I also need to think about cleaning up my record. Because if I have these fall protection violations on my record, it's going to be a lot easier for OSHA to hit me for repeat violations of this high emphasis hazard. So that's something important to think about. Other important things to think about, negative publicity. You know, you're a small construction company. You're out there bidding on jobs. You're out there trying to get new business. And, you know, OSHA citations can negatively impact your reputation. Worse than just the citations is OSHA's Regulation by Shaming program. And what they're doing, what they've been doing during this administration, is for all citation packages with a penalty, alleged violations and total penalty of around $30,000 to $35,000 will trigger OSHA uh, putting out a uh, negative enforcement press release. And what they do is on the day that the citations are issued, they publish online and push out to the AP a press release that includes a 100% of them include a negative, embarrassing, and inflammatory quotation from some, um, uh, from some official within OSHA, either the area director, regional administrator, or even folks in Washington, D.C. Uh, and they will just blast the company, say terrible things about the company for taking shortcuts and for you know, putting their employees' lives in danger. And you always see you know, pretty, pretty uh, harsh language in fall protection citations because that's you know, the leading cause of death in the construction industry. So in this scenario, you're going to get a pretty bad press release, and it's going to you know, have the potential of harming your business and harming your reputation. And then contract bid and pre-qualification. Very big deal for construction companies. Uh, if, if you're just doing private um, you know, contracting, uh, and you're, you know, sort of a subcontractor uh, level uh, company. There are, you know, general contractors out there that have pretty strict qualification criteria, and they, some will say, as, as much as have no serious OSHA violations, or you can't have more than such and such, uh, you know, injury rate or, you know, OSHA citation history. And part of the rationale is that the contractor doesn't want to have an OSHA magnet working on their site. If you've got a record and there's a good chance that OSHA is going to come visit you again because you've been cited in the past, uh, they're just not going to let you work on their project. So if you've got a bad OSHA record and a handful of OSHA citations, it's going to really put in jeopardy your ability to get new work, get new business. And this is absolutely the case if you are a government contractor uh, in the wake of just, I think, a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, uh, the government published in the Federal Register the final uh, FAR and Department of Labor guidance, uh, which really formalizes what has been a historical process of evaluating the business integrity of companies that engage in significant government contracts. So if you are you know, looking to help build or you know, ma make major changes to a military base uh, or do any sort of contracting with the government, for significant government contracts, contracts I think at $500,000, valued at $500,000 or more, then 
um, they are going to look at your, you have to actually proactively submit to the government your labor record, and that includes OSHA citations, wage and hour violations, EEOC charges, you know, NLRA, um, um, uh, NLRB uh, claims, um, things like that. All of that is going to be submitted proactively by the employer during the bid process and put them at risk of losing out on the contract or being forced into some untenable uh, labor compliance agreement or something like that with the government. So another thing to think about when you get those citations, so often I have the first phone call with a client or potential client and they say, here's what the penalty is, it's not so bad, or here's what the penalty is, we've got to do something about that. And there's no consideration to these other factors. These other factors are incredibly important. Employers definitely need to think about it. So another scenario, still involving a small construction business. In this scenario, there is one other than serious violation, a meager $250 penalty, but the citation was for a forklift uh, not being properly rated in the area uh, that it was working. Uh, Micah, what are some things that that employer ought to be thinking about uh, with that set of citations? Well, I've got $250 in my pocket, so I'll just pay it and we'll move on. It's other than serious, it's all fine, right? Maybe not quite. That's what we hear too often. <laughs> That's what we hear. Um, but as, as Eric uh, has suggested previously, uh, there's a little more to it than that. This one in particular, it, it's sticky. Uh, and what makes it sticky is, is the very specific facts. Um, you've got a citation for a forklift um, not being uh, rated for the location. So maybe they're saying that you have a, a this is an area that's uh, subject to electrical classification, that there's potentially hazardous atmosphere and you're using an internal combustion engine forklift. Um, I'm sure those those of you on the, on the line that have sites that use uh, specialized forklifts know how much more expensive the, those things are and some, also some of the performance uh, considerations that go with using different types. Um, so if you're a construction contractor and you get this measly little citation and it says, oh yeah, that uh, forklift that you're using doesn't quite work in this, in this area, uh, that should uh, pose some serious concerns for you. Uh, maybe this job has closed down and you're not working on that site anymore, but if OSHA has considered an area that where you were working at one construction site to be electrically classified, then there's a decent chance at another one they, they'll also see this. Um, so what you have to look at here is the feasible abatement. How do you solve this problem? Because not only do you have to pay the penalty, you also have to live with um, the, the citations that you've accepted. So if OSHA accuses you of certain conduct and you accept that um, it was violative of the standard, then on your next job site, you need to behave as if um, the exact, uh, you need to be prepared for the same conditions to be applied. Otherwise, you're going to be looking at um, repeat violations or um, if, in fact, you are on a long-standing job and this, you know, you're still on the same work site, if you just pay the penalty and don't abate the citations, OSHA can come back um, and do a, a, a follow-up inspection and then issue citations for failure to abate. Um, and those uh, are actually on a per-day basis. So uh, the penalty can be um, extreme if they come back six months or a year later and find out that you've been using the same equipment for the entire time. So absolutely, any citation that you get, you have to keep an eye on what are the abatement measures. Um, can, can, we, um, can we abate this and still do business? Uh, and that leads directly to, this, the, to the next part, which is a competitive disadvantage. Um, if you are um, because of uh, an OSHA citation and the abatement required, if you're required to do certain things that your competitors aren't, you may be at a competitive disadvantage. Um, if you're, you're stuck using electrical um, sealed electric forklifts instead of internal combustion engine forklifts, you may um, be able to lift much less than your competitors could and complete work much more slowly. Or maybe um, to take it away from the forklift, if, if you're subject to some kind of uh, interesting abatement for fall protection, you may be stuck with all kinds of setup costs, um, things that make you uh, take much longer to finish a job. Uh, and so 
your uh, your clients, your your general contractors, are going to find that out very quickly. That it's going to take you 20% or 50% longer to do to do a job, and um, we all know they have their own time constraints to worry about. So um, it's not exactly a contract bid issue, but it absolutely can put you at a uh, competitive disadvantage. Um, like Eric discussed earlier, this also puts you at a, a pretty significant risk of repeat violations. Um, if you're getting cited for forklift used at one site, there's a good chance you could get cited um, or forklift used at a different site. Uh, and then here, this is one's a little further out. Um, you can also have some problems with your insurance premiums and coverage. Um, what we're talking about here is uh, forklift use in a, in a classified area. Um, it's quite possible that your insurer wasn't expecting you to be operating equipment in an area like this. Um, you may, if your insurer finds out about this, you may find your premiums being boosted significantly, or you may find yourself without coverage. Um, so OSHA alleging that you're um, doing work in a, a specific area that has certain hazards, um, if you accept that, you may end up committing to um, needing different insurance or, or not qualifying for the current insurance you have. So that one is a, a little further removed. It's harder to, to see the connection, but it, uh, we've seen it happen for some clients that um, their choices on a, a little measly OSHA citation may actually affect their business uh, more significantly when it comes to their insurance coverage later on. Um, so those are some of the, the main things there. Uh, if we run to the next um, hypothetical, uh, this one is a little closer to what everyone would recognize as a, a serious problem. Uh, if we have a refinery explosion with a fatality, um, OSHA comes in, does a, does a big inspection, and issues three willful PSM violations along with a handful of others with a, a penalty of $372,000. Uh, we all recognize that this is a big case, um, but Eric, what are some of the particular considerations here? Yeah, I think this raises pretty much every consideration that an employer needs to uh, needs to, to 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 mull over when they get a set of citations. Here, you've got the catastrophe scenario. Uh, I, I think we say that this involved a, a fatality as well. Um, yeah, with a fatality, so you've got you know multiple process safety management violations for a refinery, which is the core of your business. Very significant allegations uh, by OSHA. Um, I think we also said that there were willful violations in this situation, right? Willful violations that perhaps uh, were directly related to <clears throat> to the uh, fatality itself, uh, which raises potential criminal implications. So there's all sorts of things that need to be uh, thought about in this process. Some different ones than what we've talked about before. Um, here, the uh, impact on civil litigation because we've got. Uh, deaths involved here, and often at refineries, uh, you're, you're, you've got contractors involved, people who are not your employees, so workers' comp exclusivity may not bar a suit. In some scenarios, in some states, willful OSHA violation can be used by a clever plaintiff's attorney to try and circumvent uh, that workers' comp exclusivity, so the OSHA citation may help create uh, a civil lawsuit where one should not be permitted. Uh, in some states, it's just permitted as a matter of law, uh, and so the citations will um, uh, will be significant, uh, can be used as evidence in the civil suit depending on state law, um, and in some circumstances, very rarely, you can see that citations can result in negligence per se. Uh, so OSHA, with authority over safety and health, says you blew it, you didn't comply with the law in a way that caused this accident, uh, that's going to be very harmful to you in a civil suit. So that might be a reason to say, we've got to dig in and get rid of these citations because they're going to cause us great harm in this potential civil suit. Maybe you know create an environment where the suit is allowed because of the violations, maybe use as evidence to, to generate punitive damages, uh, maybe use as evidence of negligence. So, that's a consideration in an accident case uh, where OSHA citations are involved that you have to think about. Here are the SFEP situation. These citations on their own qualify you uh, for the SFEP in a couple of ways. One, a willful violation related to a fatality. 
is one way that you qualify into the program. Another is three willful or repeat PSM violations. So in either of those scenarios, you qualify for SFAP based on these allegations. And so you would have to try through resolving these citations to change the underlying violations, either get rid of them, change the characterization, change the standards that were cited in a way that gets you out from uh, get you out of the SFAP program in that um, uh, in that instance. Uh, insurance premiums and coverage definitely could be affected in this scenario, just as Micah just described. Negative publicity, there will certainly be publicity around a big enforcement action like that. Uh, FAR qualification, again, this is that bidding on government contracts. Many in the refining industry uh, provide fuel to, uh, to the Department of Defense or to the government, um, and those contracts are covered by this FAR DOL guidance that was just issued. So having significant violations on your record uh, would very much endanger your ability to continue to contract with the government. And then it's not on here, but the biggest thing that I would think about when I got a call about these citations would be you got willful violations, you've got a fatality, there is a potential for a criminal charge. Um, under the OSH Act, a willful violation that causes an employee death can be charged under the OSH Act uh, as a crime with significantly higher penalties, and, you know, and it's a crime. It's certainly not something that, uh, that any employer wants to, uh, to deal with. So you would want to think about how you manage the citations in the context that there may be a referral to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So A, getting rid of willfuls might eliminate that referral, or you're just going to manage the whole process differently because the threat of the referral is hanging out there. So some you know, very significant considerations there. Another scenario here, you're a federal government contractor, you have 24 conduct related to a subcontractor. Um, and here, you know, these are violations that you didn't commit directly, but a subcontractor on your site that you have control over as a general contractor all show up on your record now, 24 serious violations. Michael, what are some things that need to be uh, implicated by those types of citations? So just like in the last one, um, we, we've lit up most of these considerations here. Um, you have a, a case with 24 serious uh, violations. Uh, you're not going to see that for, a, you're not going to get a penalty of probably less than $100,000 on that. So, um, you know, any, any business can, uh, would consider a six-figure citation to be uh, worth talking about at least. So you're going to look at the monetary uh, penalty amount. Um, we've already talked about feasible abatement, but this one's a little trickier because these um, violations are for um, conduct related to a subcontractor. So when you're a general contractor, uh, you, you have um, probably lots of subcontractors. And as we all know, there's only so much you can do to supervise them. We, you, you should um, exercise a lot of diligence in keeping an eye on them, of having high standards for the people that you subcontract out to, and um, good supervision for them when they're on site. At the same time, um, you, you can't be there every moment of every day. Um, you can't control exactly the employees that they hire. Uh, and so you're, you're going to be a little bit stuck with, with who you can get. And if you're on a project in a remote area, uh, you may be looking at a different um, pool of potential contractors than otherwise, uh, such that you're, you're stuck with who's around. So uh, one thing to consider here is how well um, can you abate these hazards knowing that they were um, conditions essentially created by your, con by your subcontractors. Um, the the specific, specifics of this will um, depend on the uh, situation that you encounter, what kind of job site, but it's a good thing to keep an eye on. Um, competitive disadvantages back. Uh, if you're a, a government contractor and you have um, these um, serious violations out there, uh, you, you face uh, the potential of not being able to, to um, meet that bid, just as Eric talked about earlier. Um, we're back at risk of repeat violations, I think, as we've been um, on every one of these. This one's particularly challenging because you have 24 serious violations. Um, OSHA has lots of different standards, but uh, if, if they've just dinged you for 24 different ones or 24 different sections, 
they've, they've covered a, a decent uh, portion of their jurisdiction there. So um, you, you're on the hook for the next five years um, for potential repeats on all of those. Um, just like before, we have the potential for um, a future SVEP qualification. I won't cover that again. Um, insurance premiums and coverage, again, um, you're, you're potentially affected by that. Uh, negative publicity, of course, um, contract bid and pre-qualification and bar qualification. Um, and so, yeah, there's lots of uh, different concerns here. And the, the thing to really think about is the, the fact that it's a subcontractor. In OSHA's uh, world these days, they have a multi-employer um, citation policy. And in that policy, they are, they're, make it quite explicit that they're happy to cite uh, just about everybody for the different hazards. And as the general contractor, um, you're, the, you're the one who's, who's most likely to, to take a hit for something that wasn't exactly um, something that your employees created. So um, that's definitely something to keep an eye on here. Um, and it can cause lots of problems for you uh, down the road. So next we're going to move on to, we've covered these uh, hypothetical scenarios and I hope it gave everyone a, a better sense of what to watch out for uh, or some things to think about when they have those citations. Um, we'll do a quick run through the uh, steps in the post citation process um, just to give you a sense of, of what that looks like. Um, the first step um, is the informal settlement conference. Uh, so after you ha have the citations in hand, you have 15 working days to decide whether to contest or accept them. Um, it's very typical to have an informal settlement conference where you sit down with OSHA and um, talk through the citations. It's a, it's a good opportunity to try to get some of these things settled. Um, I'll, we had a question uh, come up uh, from one of the participants earlier uh, about OSHA's obligation to negotiate. Let's just say OSHA. Um, tells you at the settlement conference, hey, these, these aren't negotiable. We've talked about these. There's not really anything you can do. There's nothing you can tell us that's going to convince us otherwise. And the question was, don't they have to consider your evidence? Um, the uh, technical answer, I suppose, is yes, that they should. As the regulator, um, they are looking uh, to, they're essentially, they're charging a violation of, of OSHA standard. And, uh, they should consider the, the evidence that points toward that and against that. Uh, as a matter of practice, though, uh, once you're at the informal settlement conference, um, you're often dealing with an area director uh, and not the compliance officer that was actually on site. Uh, so you have the supervisor of, of the person who issued the citation. They may or may not have been deeply involved in the uh, process of issuing them. Uh, and as Eric said earlier, they, uh, they don't have a strong incentive to, to give much at this, um, at this phase. No one's holding their feet to the fire. Um, they can choose to believe you or not believe you. Most of the time what we hear at the informal settlement conference, if we do bring in uh, some new information, things that they had never heard before, uh, is, is disbelief from the area director uh, saying, well, if this is really the case, why, why didn't this come up during the inspection? I mean, my, my compliance officer was on site for two weeks. They had, you had all this opportunity to bring this up, uh, and now here you are presenting this for the first time. So um, they technically probably should consider whatever evidence you present. Um, I've definitely seen cases where they uh, appeared to maybe consider the evidence, but probably really didn't. So. Um, at a minimum, uh, informal settlement conferences are usually good to uh, get a sense of what OSHA is thinking um, to try to get a settlement uh, out of it. But if you can't get the settlement uh, that you want uh, from the informal conference, then you move to your notice of contest. As I said, Micah, there, there's one more question here that I think this is probably timely to get into as well. Somebody asked if area offices know that they are limited in what they are allowed to offer at the informal settlement conference stage, you know, I talked about how the area officers are handcuffed now, do they lower their initial citation classifications and penalties? The area offices have a standard that they have to follow for citation classifications and penalties, or are they just letting the system take the course? I would say it's certainly discretion. There is a ton of discretion at the area office level when citations are issued, but there is also a lot of guidance they are uh, required to follow. 
So I would say the most discretion they have is whether to cite something is, is in assigning a characterization. But once they decide on a characterization other than serious, serious, willful repeat, then they're pretty much bound to follow the penalty calculations that are set in the field operations manual. And one of the things, you know, it's kind of a black box that's going on back there, but there is this formula that's in the field operations manual, but you wonder how much discretion uh, there is there. I talked to some of my friends in area offices around the country around this new penalty increase that kicked on August 1st, and I asked them, are we going to see a bunch of citations issued on August 2nd so that you get to use the higher penalties? And to, to the person, every one of the area directors said no, the area offices are not crazy about these new penalties because they know it's going to make their jobs much harder because it is going to necessarily drive up penalties 80% and it's going to make it harder to settle cases at the informal stage. It's going to make things go deeper into the process, cause litigation, cause their co-shows to be deposed, and it's going to be a real burden on the area offices. And they are bound, once they make the decision that this is a willful or this is a serious or whatever, that they've got to follow that penalty calculation uh, in the field operations manual, so they're stuck. You know, and, and it's everything is just pushed up by 80%. So they, um, you know, hopefully you'll see some things that used to be willful violations become serious violations because the penalty is so much higher. But I'd be very surprised to see an area office make the decision based on penalty. You know, they're going to look at the legal standard for willfulness and apply it in their mind to meet that. And if it does, then they're going to assign the penalty that they are required to assign based on the penalty calculation. And they're going to offer at the informal settlement conference the maximum penalty reduction that they can. Well, maybe they will, maybe they won't, depending on what they think of you and the arguments you present. But that's why that informal stage is a little bit more rigid than dealing with the solicitor's office. The solicitor's office is not bound by any you know, maximum penalty reduction. Uh, they'll tell you they're not the decision maker either. The area office is. But if they go in and say, hey, we can resolve this case if we do X, and I think we should because we've got real problems with this citation, then they can really influence the outcome, and they're not bound by that rigid you know, maximum penalty reduction. Uh, that the national office has bestowed. So, I mean, there's a lot that goes on there. So there's some part of the penalty calculation that's fixed, some part that's discretionary in how they characterize items. Uh, but I have not seen I have not seen area offices, you know, try and try and game the system to push the penalty down because you know because of their because their hands may be tied later in the process. I just haven't seen that happen. All right, so um, we're back to the um, notice of contest. Um, once you've submitted that, then we're going to kick off the, uh, the next part of the process. Um, the next phase here is the notice of docketing. Um, this is a, a, an arcane step in the procedure, but we included it only because it signals that the, the next phase starts. This is the time where OSHA has submitted the case to uh, OSHRIC, the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, and this becomes a formal case. Um, it gets filed, it has a docket number, uh, and now at this point, uh, OSHA's attorneys, the solicitor's office, uh, the solicitor of the Department of Labor, uh, is going to be the most important person, or, or the, they're gonna have a very strong say in how the case goes from there. Um, once you kick off uh, the litigation, you go to um, the OSHRC proceedings. Um, there are some mechanisms for um, settlement proceedings um, and a couple of different ways to do litigation, um, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. And then, of course, once you finish uh, the case, whether it's uh, taking it all the way through trial and getting a decision from the ALJ or settling the case, you have to deal with the, the aftermath, the fallout, um, the abatement, all of those things uh, once the case is over. So um, those are the steps there. Then uh, we'll give you a, a quick rundown of the OSHRC proceedings. Um, the first we'll do conventional litigation. This is just a straightforward case, uh, nothing special. Uh, this is the, the, the vanilla, this is a, a normal case. So once the notice of docketing is, is 
been issued, uh, you're going to see the uh, solicitor's office file a complaint, probably after filing a motion for more time to file it. That's just what we see almost every time. Uh, and then as the employer, you get to file an answer with some affirmative defenses. Um, from there, you're gonna move to discovery. Um, lots of opportunities to ask uh, OSHA for some more information to produce all those documents that you gave to them during the inspection. They'll produce those right back to you. Uh, you can do some requests for admissions and uh, depositions. Um, you know, in my experience, uh, there are, some of these things are, are more helpful than others. One of my favorite uh, things to do is to take depositions of compliance officers. Uh, because if you'll remember, we talked about at the informal settlement conference, OSHA doesn't have a strong incentive to negotiate uh, because no one's held their feet to the fire. Well, once you get to a deposition, now you have the chance to put the compliance officer under oath. You ask them questions. And at, at this point, you now know the theory of their case. You've seen um, the citations and the 1Bs, the, uh, which really gives you the full theory of their case. Um, often, those are the most illuminating things that you've seen at that point. You may have thought that the citation had to do with um, some particular um, fact or something that OSHA was worried about, and when you get those 1Bs, you, you see that actually it was a little something different. It was something that an employee said or, or, or something, and, it, and it's new information that, that um, gives you something new. So once you have that, and then you can sit down with the compliance officer and really uh, narrow down what, what they were looking at. You can also challenge them and, and say, show me, show me the evidence that this scenario you were worried about could happen, or tell me how many employees told you that this was a problem. Um, and really, that is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best opportunities to show OSHA um, the problems with their case, to give them a strong reality check on um, where, where there may or may not be violations. Um, so discovery is always a, a, a very important part of the conventional proceedings. Uh, motions practice, uh, depending on what you find during discovery, you can move to dismiss uh, certain items. Uh, you may have to do a, a little litigation about the discovery process, get OSHA to turn over some more documents, um, give you some more information about um, the details of employee complaints. Uh, OSHA will always um, take a very hard stance on uh, protecting the identity of the people they talk to, even in the, the couple of cases where they've interviewed one employee. Um, I've, I've seen them redact significant parts of their testimony, even though we, we know who they are, we know what they told them, um, they, they just uh, do that as a matter of course. So that's another thing that you may have to litigate uh, is to get the details of, of some of these um, statements that were made to compliance officers. Um, if you have not resolved the case, uh, and so I, I should say, through this discovery process and the ability to give OSHA this reality check, we see a lot of settlement uh, agreements coming, um, probably 75% or, or farther through the litigation process. Once you have all this discovery, everyone starts to get back to reality and you start looking at your cases and what you might have to do at a trial. And uh, as Eric said earlier, the solicitor's office doesn't really like to take uh, losing cases to trial. So uh, this gives you a good chance uh, at another um, uh, another opportunity for settlement. So it's a good time to uh, keep the settlement discussions going. Uh, and often you can uh, get a settlement before you get to the hearing. If you can't, um, then you're going to be looking at doing some pre-hearing statements um, all the, the particulars of getting ready for litigation, there's more paperwork that goes into the pre-hearing than uh, any of us wants to think about, but you do that, you get a hearing uh, before an ALJ, uh, and then if you make it all the way through that, you're looking at filing post-hearing briefs, uh, and then you get to wait for a month or a year or, or something like that, waiting for the ALJ to issue uh, their decision. Uh, so that's the conventional litigation. Um, procedure. Uh, there are a couple of other ways that the litigation can go. Eric, do you want to cover the next one? Sure, yeah, and I'll sort of zip through these next two um, so we can get to kind of settlement strategies and that discussion uh, before, before our time together runs out. <clears throat> there are two different sort of special 
proceedings available beyond the sort of conventional proceeding. One is simplified proceedings, and this is for you know just what it sounds like: small, simple, basic cases, um, cases that don't involve significant penalties, cases that don't involve injuries, cases that don't involve um, or, or will not or uh, should or should not involve expert case you know expert witnesses and things like that. Uh, if you have a case that meets that criteria, the review commission will assign it to simplified proceedings, and then both parties have an opportunity to say, hey, we don't think this is appropriate. We think we do need an expert here, um, or, or we do need discovery here, so let's kick this case back to conventional. But sometimes there is an appropriate path um, uh, called simplified proceedings for basic cases. What this allows you to do is to get for a judge a lot quicker and a lot cheaper. Uh, there will not be discovery. There won't be experts. There won't be a long, drawn-out process where, where Mike and I, uh, you know, charge lots of billable hours to you. It's going to go quicker. You're going to get before a judge quicker, and it'll be more affordable. Uh, but it tends to be for cases where simple issues of law are fact, small penalties, things like that. So it's something. It's something that you know may be appropriate for your case, uh, depending on the circumstances. The other scenario for special cases is the other end of the spectrum. For very significant cases, there is a process called the mandatory settlement proceedings. And this is, I think, a very, very good process that the Review Commission has been using for a while now. And that is for these big significant cases that involve either a penalty of $100,000 or more or a case involving an employee fatality, the case is automatically assigned to this mandatory settlement proceeding. And what happens is a judge, one of the ALJs, who is the same type of person who would hear the case at a hearing but is not the specific person who would hear your case, is assigned to your case as a mediator. And he oversees a process before the parties get into any kind of detailed discovery and before you, you know, head down that expensive litigation path, he will hold an in-person mediation where he will you know, follow all the tools that mediators uh, are trained to do, you know, get, get the parties in separate rooms and go back and forth and try and convince them to move closer to an agreeable settlement, get the parties together in a room and let them talk to each other, uh, and just try through a process over a day or two or three uh, to try and get you to resolve your case through that mediation. And if it doesn't work, then it kicks back out to the conventional litigation process that Micah uh, described a moment ago. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about settlement goals and, uh, and, and strategies. So there are a, a few things um, to think about, and these all tie back to uh, the considerations, that big slide that we had earlier, and we went through in detail for the different hypotheticals. and. Um, so these are going to sound very familiar as I, as I run through them. But your goals as you're eyeing these settlements, whether it's at the informal conference, whether you've done some discovery and you're, um, you're, you're negotiating during litigation, or maybe you're at a mandatory settlement, um, here, these are the things to really consider. Um, one of the biggest is to eliminate the ten potential for repeat violations. Uh, this is the thing that can turn simple, cheap penalties $250. Uh, it's $250 today, but the next time OSHA comes back, it could be $125,000. Um, so keep an eye on what you're being cited for, uh, whether these are standards that are core to your business. This is one of the most important things to watch out for. Uh, the next thing here is to mitigate the impact of uh, the OSHA citations on uh, civil litigation. So if you're looking at willful citations, you could very easily end up outside of the workers' comp exclusion. Um, willful conduct by an employer is often translated to grossly negligent uh, or whatever the, the standard for workers' comp um, is in your state. Um, so you, you have to keep an eye on that. This is very important, particularly when you have uh, an employee injury or an employee fatality. Um, that the same goes for um, the evidence of your negligence. If you uh, admitted through a, a settlement agreement, even if you put the, the nice language in there that we always do that, you know, we're, we're settling this um, to avoid further litigation and we don't really admit to anything, uh, any particular wrongdoing, that usually doesn't help you very much uh, in terms of the per se negligence uh, or evidence of negligence when it goes straight to the, uh, the conduct that was described in the citation. So 
If you take a citation for not having fall protection uh, or not having appropriate fall protection, uh, you're, you're going to have a hard time when that contractor who was injured in the fall sues you um, because you didn't provide appropriate fall protection. Um, you can bet that the civil attorney will be using that as evidence. Uh, and then even uh, past just using as evidence, you can uh, see claims for punitive damages because uh, this is especially true when you have willful citations. Uh, now you're grossly negligent or, or even worse. So uh, that can be a big problem. Um, you also should focus on uh, eliminating serious violations. In particular, if you're a contractor, um, usually uh, most general contractors or the federal government, they, they draw a line at, uh, at serious and above as the worst things that will really disqualify you. Uh, do be, be aware of um, the companies that you bid with uh, because I, we have seen a few that consider any OSHA violation to be a problem. Uh, so keep an eye on that, but usually um, you're looking to keep things um, below serious. Um, all right, uh, you want to reduce your civil penalties, uh, and as Eric discussed earlier, you definitely want to uh, avoid SVAP. Um, so you need to keep an eye on those uh, qualification criteria, uh, whether it's the dollar amount or the specific citations. Um, we've already talked about a little bit the criminal referrals. Um, this, uh, this becomes an issue when there's a fatality. You absolutely want to avoid the, the willful citations when you've got a fatality. Um, you, uh, we already touched on this a little bit. The, um, you've got to protect your responsible contractor designation to make, your, make sure you can still um, bid on federal contracts. Um, another one that's a little squishier is customer reputation and um, the negative publicity. Um, every, everyone, every business out there has, has customers and uh, we've all seen what bad accidents or, or being dragged through the mud by an OSHA press release and, and other coverage, what it can do to your reputation. Uh, and whether you're selling products directly to the, to the public or not, um, it can have a, a strong effect on your, on your business. Um, we talked earlier about the insurance coverage. You need to make sure that whatever you admit to in, a, in an OSHA citation in a settlement, that you aren't expanding um, your, your working environment to things that you aren't covered by. Um, so you should, you should be sure to know um, what, what activities may trigger uh, extra insurance um, uh, problems. Um, of course, you've got to watch out for the abatement. Anything that OSHA wants you to do, even if it's a zero penalty item, uh, you have to abate it if you, if you accept the citation. So, Absolutely watch out for things that you can't abate or things that will um, put you at an unfair advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis your competitors. Uh, and finally, um, particularly when there's an employee injury, watch out for things that are going to subject you to a workers' compensation multiplier. Um, so those are the goals to keep, out, to keep in mind. Um, Eric, how do you get from, we, we know what our goals are, but how do you get to, um, to the place where OSHA is going to give you what you need? Right. So, I mean, that's the big question here is, and we've talked about it throughout this presentation is, hey, I, I don't want this big penalty. You know, I, I don't want to be set up for repeat violations. I don't want these citations to affect my civil suit. So what do I do? And there's a handful of ways that you can accomplish those goals. The, the sort of the simplest, I shouldn't say the simplest, the one that is you know, the cleanest, the way that you are assured to not have repeat exposure in the future and assured that the citations will not harm you in a civil suit uh, and will not qualify you for SVAP and set you up for future SVAP is to get the citations withdrawn. Obviously, that's not the simplest approach because you've got a party across the table from you, OSHA, that doesn't want to withdraw the citations. They issued them for a reason. They believe they're grounded in fact. But if you can go in and demonstrate that they got it wrong, and they get it wrong a lot, and you know, not to insult them, I think they have a difficult job to do. Uh, they have the shortest statute of limitations of any enforcement agency that I'm aware of, uh, six months uh, from the occurrence of a violation to issue a citation. That is often uh, a real challenge to develop an effective and complete investigation uh, to, to, to really support violations. Certainly willful violations with big dollar penalties, they're doing it with imperfect information. Uh, you know, if you're managing your inspection very effectively, you know, you're just providing them the information that they ask for and, and nothing more, which often means that there's a lot of information 
almost unlimited information that OSHA does not have when they issue the citations. So you want to go in and present the case for why they got it wrong and convince them that they should withdraw the citations. Um, and, and if you are able to, to get the citation withdrawn, you have accomplished all of the goals and all of the concerns and all of the considerations we talked about all day. If it's withdrawn, there's no penalty. If it's withdrawn, your insurance company is not going to get excited about it. If it's withdrawn, it can't be used in a workers' comp environment. It can't be used in a civil suit. It can't be used in a future enforcement action by OSHA. So number one effective strategy for avoiding all of those negative consequences is get the citation withdrawn. Other ways that you can accomplish some of the goals we've talked about is to try to convince OSHA to modify the characterization. In other words, to, to downgrade a willful or repeat violation to serious or to downgrade a serious violation to other than serious or de minimis or a willful or repeat down to other than serious or de minimis. And by doing that, you accomplish a number of things. One, the penalty is going to go down significantly. It's going to go down you know, perhaps by 10 times or more than 10 times the original proposed penalty because going from that willful or repeat down to something other than that, um, you know, OSHA is bound to follow their penalty criteria set by statute, so they can't have a serious or other than serious violation with a $100,000 penalty. It has to be $12,000 or, or around $12,000 or less. Uh, so that's going to help accomplish some of your penalty objectives. Changing the characterization is also going to have significant impacts on all of the other uh, considerations we talked about, like the impact on uh, uh, potential uh, civil suits. It's that willful characterization that is likely to convince some judges in the country to say, hey, this uh, circumvents the workers' comp exclusivity bar. It's that willful characterization that's going to be used and introduced in evidence at a trial in a civil suit to perhaps um, uh, trigger punitive damages. So getting that violation downgraded from willful to something else will accomplish a lot of goals there. Likewise, downgrading from willful or repeat to serious or other than serious um, would impact severe violator enforcement program qualifying citations. Remember, it takes one willful or repeat related to a fatality, two or more willful or repeats related to a high emphasis hazard, three or more willful or repeats related to process safety management to qualify you into the severe violator enforcement program. So simply changing one, you know, one of these willfuls or multiple of these willfuls or repeats down to serious or other than serious eliminates that qualifying criteria uh, and would protect you from severe violator enforcement program in that particular case. Now, if it's still on your record, it may set you up for future qualifying into the SVEP based on repeat violations, but at least in this instance, if you did qualify and you changed the underlying citations, then you would be removed from the program um, in that context. So very important consequences there. Uh, likewise, willful violations related to a fatality can trigger that criminal investigation and prosecution. If you can, real quickly, before the case is referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office or while the U.S. Attorney is looking at it, convince OSHA that it should not have been characterized as willful and get it downgraded, that almost certainly would protect you from uh, a criminal uh, prosecution uh, in that context. So very important uh, way to accomplish some of your goals there. Uh, other things that you can do to affect some of these goals, eliminate duplication. You see a lot of times where OSHA cites the same exact conduct under five different standards and it allows them to throw five penalties at the thing and get a lot more mess on your record that can be cited in the future for repeat violations and you know, make your conduct look much worse in the context of a civil suit. So if you take these five violations all related to falls uh, but under different substandards and subsections of OSHA's portfolio of regulations and say, hey, look, if we want to resolve this case, OSHA, take these five violations and let's tuck them into a single violation. You get a penalty, you get abatement, but we're not going to take five violations. But we'll take one. Uh, that would help with a lot of these goals we've talked about. A, it's going to drive the penalty down because you're going from five violations with penalties down to one. It's going to help protect your record. You're going to have only one violation, which hopefully will not impact your ability to bid on government contracts or private contracts. It's going to have many fewer targets on your record for OSHA to shoot at in future violations uh, for, for um, uh, in future site uh, inspections to find the bases for repeat violations, which should protect you 
from uh, the severe violator enforcement program because if you only have one, uh, the only way you get into the um, SFEP circumstances with a fatality, uh, a willful or repeat related to that one standard uh, and a fatality. Otherwise, it takes two or more. So having um, uh, just one violation on your record would be helpful uh, in that regard. Accepting alternative cited standards is one of the more creative things that we've started doing in the last several years to accomplish a lot of our goals uh, and to do it in a way that you know, makes it much more agreeable to OSHA. OSHA doesn't like to withdraw violations. They don't like to walk away from the table empty-handed. And many, many of my clients, many of the circumstances we're dealing in, the penalty is really of no concern to us. What is of concern is the specific standard we were cited under. And if we can get OSHA to agree to amend to a cited standard that is outside of, for example, the high-emphasis hazard category that qualifies you into SVEP, then that would accomplish you know, an important goal, get out of SVEP. If it is a standard that is you know, at the core of our business and we know that we're going to have you know, fall, we're going to be scrutinized for our fall protection program every time OSHA shows up on site or we're going to be scrutinized about our machine guarding every time OSHA shows up because we've got thousands of machines and thousands of opportunities for a guard to not meet their satisfaction. So that 1910.212 standard that is cited in every machine case, uh, guarding case, um, we just know that that's going to create you know, major headaches for us in the future. We could accept a violation, but move it out to some generic standard, perhaps one that's not really applicable to circumstances, that's not going to create future problems for us, but allows OSHA to say, we've got a violation, we've got a penalty, and we get abatement. But the standard is not going to, you know, and we, maybe OSHA doesn't care for the standard, but they get the things that are important to them, and the employer gets the things that are important to the employer by you know, protecting their record, getting this uh, uh, problematic violation off the record, getting out of SVEP, for example, if you get in by you know, the high emphasis hazard category and you change it to a standard that is not a high emphasis hazard, you're out of SVEP. If it is a standard that is not related to an accident, and you've got a violation related to the accident and you change the cited standard, then it's no longer you know, a, a potential basis for a criminal charge. It's no longer uh, the basis for um, a, a, you know, uh, circumventing the workers' comp exclusivity bar because it's not a violation that was related to the incident, intentional, that had nothing to do with harm, for example, because it is you know, related to signage or related to something totally different than the accident would be a way to avoid these consequences we've been talking about. So thinking about alternative cited standards is a great way to, to, uh, to deal with some of the goals that we've been trying to accomplish. And then finally, modifying violation language, also very important for some of these contexts like you know, the, the, the civil suit that's going on in parallel, potential criminal cases that are related to citations, uh, or the threat of potential future repeat violations. If you rewrite the violation in a way that is, you know, very, very specific or, you know, very different than what is your ordinary business practice, you are creating a buff or a, a description that is very, very different than, you know, what the incident, you know, the personal injury or the, or, or the uh, wrongful death suit may be about. You're protecting a lot of the interests that we've been talking about just right of the violation. Um, so you fought hard to get it withdrawn. OSHA won't agree to do it. These are some alternative ways to accomplish those goals short of getting the violations withdrawn. A couple other things that are important to do to accomplish some of the strategies we've talked about is one, try to negotiate for a very strong um, exculpatory clause. Uh, that's a non-admissions clause in the settlement agreement that will hopefully, not always, but hopefully, protect um, the use of the OSHA citation and the use of the violations as amended in the citation from being admitted in the context of a civil suit uh, and, and likely also a criminal suit if there is one. So if you're able to bargain for an effective exculpatory clause, uh, you might be able to accept a violation that is related to an injury with the expectation that that will not be admitted in a civil suit and used against you. Other strategies that we are using, probably the most significant 
on, on any of these two slides that we've been uh, using lately. I would say in combination with the alternative cited standards is this next one about enhanced and or corporate-wide abatement. You know, OSHA is most of the people that we deal with at OSHA are there and doing their job for the right reason. And they believe in, they, they drank the Kool-Aid, and they believe in protecting employee safety and health. So when you talk with these folks about citations, their focus is not on the dollars, and their focus is not on the characterization. Their focus is generally on the abatement, and it is about protecting employees. So one of the things we've been able to do is to say, look, this is the thing that's most important to you, Oda, so let's put together a package of what I call enhanced compliance, what OSHA typically calls abatement. Whatever it is, it is a commitment, a set of commitments for actions that the company, that the employer is willing to take uh, to improve safety and health of its employees. And I put corporate-wide in here as well because often we're doing things that go beyond the individual location that OSHA visited and put together a package of things that OSHA cannot require you to do by law. You know, by law, they are limited to demand abatement that technically abates the, violated, uh, the violation, the violative condition in the cited standard. So the cited standard says, thou shalt you know, uh, guard a machine you know, this way. That's all they can require you to do is put a guard on that machine in that one instance. But we can make a commitment in a settlement agreement that says we will put a guard on that machine that you cited us for having an inadequate guard, but we will also hire a third-party safety professional to come in and do an audit of all of our machines or to come in and do an audit of all of our machines at our six facilities around the country and identify any machines that could have improved guarding, even some guarding that's not required by law, but certainly at least machines that were not required under this agreement to address we will do this audit for all of these facilities and we'll affect a thousand instead of just the six that work on this machine. And we'll do all that OSHA if you, you know, withdraw the violation, amend it to an alternative standard, change the characterization, reduce the penalty. Whatever it is we're trying to accomplish, we are going to put this package together, really great safety enhancements that OSHA cannot require you to do under law, and basically a horse trade. We'll give you audits and we'll give you, you know, new equipment and we'll give you a light curtain and an additional, uh, you know, additional safety bells and whistles and we'll hire a new, you know, full-time safety manager and we'll, you know, whatever it is, you come up with a bunch of creative ideas, things that OSHA would get excited about and say, we'll do all these things if you give us the relief that we're asking for. So that has been a really, really effective strategy for us lately. Uh, is using that enhanced compliance or enhanced abatement, uh, as OSHA calls it. And they get really, really excited when you start going beyond the boundaries of the individual workplace that they've just inspected because you're affecting more employees, and it's just worth more to them. I and mean, that's the idea here. You're giving them something of value and asking from them something of value for you. Um, a couple other things that we've talked about or, or some strategies you could think about would be a global settlement. Uh, if you do find yourself in the context of you know, an OSHA enforcement action and a criminal investigation, death suit all at the same time, uh, we have found that um, uh, we've been able to craft pretty effective resolutions that address all of these together. So it's, it may not be one written instrument, but you're bargaining collectively. So OSHA, you know, the family of the deceased employee uh, is getting some sort of restitution, uh, that's going to be leveraged to help you get a, result, a better result in your OSHA case. And if they feel like you're negotiating some sort of criminal outcome uh, with the U.S. Attorney's Office, that's going to help you get a better outcome. It'll be like additional value in an OSHA settlement, even though it's not part of the OSHA settlement. And likewise, if you're giving OSHA something very, you know, you know, um, that they're very excited about you know, this enhanced compliance package, then the U.S. Attorney may consider that in you know, deciding to decline criminal prosecution uh, and so on and so forth. So combine these things when you, when you do have these parallel um, actions involved. Think about ways that you might combine them to leverage the outcomes of each other uh, to get a better result in all three or four or however many different actions there might be. 
And then as a last strategy, and we've seen this work in a few instances uh, where OSHA has brought an enforcement action that has the potential to really you know, maybe shut the business down, that you might be able to get the union on your side. And OSHA is, you know, for better or worse, more or less beholden to the big national unions. So if you have, you know, a, a, an organized workforce and you're facing, you know, a, a make it or break it uh, uh, enforcement action, a bet the company enforcement action, and the union is worried that a lot of their members are going to lose jobs because of this enforcement action, you might be able to get them on your side and help you craft an enhanced, you know, set, enhanced compliance package and a settlement proposal and help you sell it to OSHA to go to OSHA with you or even with, you know, separately on their own and say, OSHA, you ought to consider this. Uh, it's very important to us as a union as well. Uh, we have seen that work um, on occasion. Um, you know, the circumstances have to be uh, just right, uh, but that's a strategy that employers might consider uh, as well. So, I, you know, I think we've used up a lot of your time. We have a couple of examples here, but I think you can kind of sort of get the gist of where we're going with these. Instead of going through these examples, uh, let's just uh, jump to questions and see if anybody else has any additional questions. Eric, we had one question come through a little earlier uh, about um, settlement conferences. And the question was, is there any appeal claim based on a defective settlement conference? I would, I would take that question to mean um, if you think that OSHA behaves improperly during a settlement conference, whether it's, I assume this is pointed at informal settlement conferences, what can you do about it? Um, Eric, what do you think? What can you do if OSHA doesn't behave properly during a, an informal? I mean, I would say that the, the primary appeal function is the notice of contest. So if you feel like OSHA is just being totally unreasonable in the informal conference, you file a notice of contest and you just have sort of the traditional appeal. If this is talking about remedies that may exist, you know, really because of their conduct in a settlement conference, I don't think there really is. I mean, I think if you're, if you're getting some real, real bad faith conduct uh, litigation process through settlement discussions, you know, there might be a motion there for sanctions or something like that. But, but technically, you know, if, if your position is essentially hey, OSHA is not budging here, you know, in the face of obvious facts that they've got it wrong, they're still not doing the right thing, I think a judge is going to say, well, you know, that's, that's their settlement position, you know, right or wrong. Your remedy is to take this case to me, the judge, um, and that's why there is an independent body of judges, the review commission that hears cases because OSHA, you know, gets it wrong and you've got a remedy there. Uh, I don't, there's not really a way to force OSHA to give you what you're looking for in settlement. You just have to negotiate hard, uh, try to get the result that you need, and if you can't get it or if they're not being reasonable, the appeal is the notice of contest and the litigation process. Uh, any other thoughts on that? No, I, I think that's 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 right. There's there's not much you can do if when when they're um, in the driver's seat in the pre-notice of contest phase. Uh, you're, you're basically asking them to change their position, and, and there's not much you can do aside from taking it to litigation. Yeah, that, so a really great question here that if one of your goals, uh, post citation goals, is to try to improve the relationship with OSHA, um, because you know you're going to be in business for a long time, you're going to deal with OSHA again in the future. Uh, is the informal conference an appropriate vehicle for trying to improve your relationship? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of different approaches, and every case calls for a different, you know, a different approach and a different strategy. There's the scorched earth approach where you go in and you just convince OSHA that you're going to, you know, beat them down in litigation and show them how wrong they are and how you're going to, you know, shred the compliance officer in the deposition, uh, and that might help you prevail on the particular matter that you're working on, but it's not going to do much. Uh, to affect, uh, positively affect your relationship with the agency. Another approach is to go in and say, look, we have the same goals here, OSHA. The most important thing to us is our employee safety, and that's why we want to uh, you know, affect a settlement here that includes all of these enhanced compliance components because these are things that are important to us, and we want your ideas too, OSHA. That's why we're here is to find out what's important to you or if you have good ideas because you've been doing this 
for a long time, and you see lots of other workplaces. So let's work together to develop a you know a program that's going to really improve safety at our. Hey, in the meantime, here are some things that we'd like to see. Can you reduce the penalty more? Can you change the characterization? Can we consider? But really, we want to focus our discussion on this enhanced compliance. That's a great way to send a positive signal to the area office. Uh, you know, get your safety director in there, dealing directly with the area director, or assistant area director, foster a positive relationship. And I would say that's not just limited to the informal conference. If you've got a significant case, can process a settlement conference, uh, get FaceTime with the agency, show them how sincere you are in uh, in making things better. Uh, but that's definitely another goal that wasn't on our slide that one of the participants raised. Uh, very, very good idea. Another thing that one of the participants raised that is also a very good idea in terms of implementing your strategy is making sure that your OSHA Council, that Micah and I, are coordinating closely with your Civil Defense Council. And we do that all the time. I mean, that's one of the beauties of, of that practice. As specialists, all I do is OSHA. I'm not going to try and sell any other service to you, and no other lawyer out there has to worry about me trying to take their business because I am just an OSHA lawyer. We work very, very well with criminal counsel, firms outside, companies outside criminal counsel, and civil counsel. You know, the people that are bringing that uh, or defending that, um, you know, uh, products liability case, wrongful death case, personal injury case that we will bring the OSHA perspective and advise them about how the OSHA citations may affect their personal injury case, uh, how our settlement can protect or mitigate the impact on the civil case, but also making sure that we're asking the right questions of criminal counsel and the civil defense counsel to make sure we're not doing something strategically in the OSHA case that affects uh, the civil case or the criminal case. So it's really important to coordinate those, those multiple uh, legal efforts uh, as you're going through the process. So great points made by uh, participants on those two fronts. Any other questions from anybody while you're thinking and possibly typing in questions? Make sure you've got all the contact information for Micah and me right here. And then also do, um, I don't think I have the slide on it anymore, but I do want to encourage everybody to check out our OSHA blog, uh, the OSHA Defense Report. Um, we also we, we post things, the advertisements about additional webinars, links to um, you know, recorded webinars, as well as uh, detailed articles. I, I'm reluctant to call it a blog. It is, I guess that's technically what it is. But we're, you know, everything that you see us put up there is really a detailed uh, article on all sorts of different OSHA subjects. Just published one today on joint employer, multi-employer worksite issues like that. A uh, detailed review last week of the anti-retaliation elements of OSHA's new record keeping rule. So definitely check out our blog and I encourage you to um, you know, sign up for the rest of the webinars for 2016 uh, and then look out soon, I suppose, for an announcement for the 2017 webinar series. We, uh, well, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I really enjoy doing these. It forces me to dig in and think critically about my practice and to learn new subjects about what OSHA is up to uh, and to get to interact with all of you and get great ideas from all of you as we're going through that process. So I've really enjoyed this um, and I was very pleased in particular to be able to introduce Micah to all of you as the newest member of our team. And we look forward to uh, you know an interesting discussion next month on uh, the next topic in the webinar series. So thanks everybody for joining us, and we'll see you next time.